Mike Hoy, speaking on the future of Firefox. Oh, hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me again. Let's see if this thing will consent to work. Um, will it work? So, I just have to tether let it tether to my phone for a moment so that I can get the slides. And, is that doing the thing? That is doing the thing. Yay. One of my favorite parts of computing uh, remains that people on the outside, like people on the outside of the IT industry are asking questions like, is AI going to destroy us all? And people on the inside of it are asking questions like, why doesn't the projector work? <laughs> um, it's his, it never gets tired. Um, so this is the state of Mozilla. Uh, I'm very fortunate to uh, have had a chance to talk to you last year uh, at about this time in the week run up to the release of our project, uh, of our biggest, most important project, I would argue, to date as a company. And that was the release um, of Firefox Quantum. I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what led up to it and so on. Uh, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about where we're going uh, and what's coming up next for us. And I hope that it'll be uh, interesting to you. Um, and if not, well, just sit there, I guess. Uh, so I was last here in November of 2017. And November 2017 was a stressful time for us as an organization for a lot of different reasons. The biggest one, of course, was that this is the release of two years, two and a half years of really sort of difficult, challenging development work to uh, get us to this. Uh, this is Firefox Nightly logo, but get us to this new Firefox Quantum, um, which I trust, of course, that you're all using regularly. Um, Firefox Quantum represented a major infrastructural change for us. We changed just about every part of the browser, including a lot of really important core stuff um, that we used, uh, some new tools we had at our disposal, new languages like Rust, components that we were pulling in from Servo, uh, a few other things like that. And it turns out um, uh, this is what this is a slide from the talk last year. This is the three big bets that we made getting to, like, that we, and at the time I said, like, it's not enough that we get most of the way there. We can't do an okay job at this. We have to win this one. Like, this is an existential problem for Mozilla. If we can't ship a competitive browser, if we can't ship a competitive product that is at least as good as, you know, that is on a par with Chrome, that is functionally comparable to Safari, that a user can look at and say, this is a good experience, then we are in existential trouble as an organization. Internally, this is how we were talking about this. Like, this is what we want to achieve here. We are going to take the idea of fast away from Chrome, and we are never letting them have it back. And we did that, right? After the work that we did to re-underpin and re-harden this project. After we took what used to be a really very much a product of its time, like a, a code base that dated from when you had one CPU, from when you were running a thread, right? For when you were using that to do a relatively small number of things, to re-underpin all of our assumptions about that, right? To make multi-process Firefox, to rewrite chunks of it in a language that didn't exist a decade. Right? That was an enormous amount of work. Um, and it wasn't just underpinning the code as well. It, the entire project got a visual refresh. Right, The Photon project reskinned it in a lot of interesting ways. And it was quite a miraculous... I will be fortunate if I get another experience like this in my career to see teams of people from... Like, groups of people with wildly different backgrounds and disciplines all looking at the work that each other are doing with an enormous amount of admiration respect, right? People from the JS compiler team, right? And we have several different layers of JS compiler under the hood there. Um, but people who work on compilers for fun, talking with a great deal of admiration to the people who are doing the UX redesign um, and vice versa, right? And that kind of respect and, collab or, and cooperation really, really working effectively across every single part of the product. And the deep focus that we got from uh, our leadership 
because uh, it turns out um, you may have you may be under the impression, and a lot of younger engineers are under the impression, that managers are kind of something that gets in the way. Um, funny story, that is the opposite of the truth. And the leadership that we had leading up to this gave us a tremendous amount of discipline and focus that helped us to ship this product. It's really good. If you haven't tried it out yet, I trust you have, because we're all, you know, this is the right audience for that kind of thing. Um, but this is still the kind of thing that we are capable of. Uh, my friend Jonathan Nightingale, a long time ago, said about a massive, re about another piece of work that we've done as a company. He said that a lot of these things look impossible until you decide they're important, right? And we were able to say, okay, this does, you know, I don't know if this is possible or not, but it's, it's fundamentally important. And we succeeded at doing that. Um, okay, so we do that. Um, great. We've got a competing browser. Like we've got a product that is faster in most, faster along many benchmarks that matter to, than Chrome, uh, faster than Safari. We have what, we've built what we believe to be the best web browser on the market. And a lot of the metrics that we have, admittedly not all of them, Chrome's a competing product, um, but a lot of them bear that out. So do we win? Like, great, we're done. We, we, we win. Okay, we're not done. Um, there's still a lot out there that we need to do, but that brings us to 2018. Um, and so we had a little bit of a hiatus there. Um, not where we get to rest on our laurels, but where we get to rest at all, right? This has been two years of work, um, and it's been two years of really, really hard work. Like this has not been, for, for some parts of the team, this has been death march material. Um, for other parts of the organization, this has been leading up to stuff that we haven't actually had a chance to ship yet. So it wasn't game ready in time for quantum. Some of that stuff is just starting to come out now. Stuff like the web render work, that team is starting to, being able to leverage your graphics hardware to blow in, you know, to throw your web pages faster in a way that's interesting and novel. There's some other stuff, some R&D stuff coming out of the, uh, the JavaScript teams where we're talking about making fundamental, like, CS level advances to how we emit and decode JavaScript that are fascinating. And they're still coming down too. But at least we have a moment there where we can, like, take a breath and say, okay, we did it. We have more to do, right? We clearly have stuff that is coming down the pipe that is still interesting. We're still working on SIP and showing a lot of it. But at least we can take a break. Um, and then this kind of happened. Um, the beginning of, uh, does anyone remember how good we felt about the beginning of 2018 when we start hearing about Spectre, right? And now there's this entire class, like generally speaking, getting zero date by your CPU vendor is not a good experience. <laughs> I'm just going to throw that out there. And that's not a fair characterization. We didn't get zero date by this. Um, we have a good relationship with, we have a really good relationship with Intel and AMD. Um, and we have a great partnership with the other browser vendors as well. So despite the fact that we are competing on a number of different axes, there are a number of places as well where we all have common interests. And one of those places we have common interests is having the web be actually safe and reliable to use. Spectre, um, can I get a show of hands here? How many people feel comfortable talking about like the technical details of Spectre? I'm not going to raise my hands, um, but the general, the, the general thrust of it is that if you can execute code on a machine, then you can execute, you can run a certain kind of timing attack against a cache. Um, and as a result of that, you can sort of, you can leverage these timing attacks to read into arbitrary chunks of memory. Uh, Spectre and Meltdown are both, you know, they're both differently constrained on that. But I mean, for the most part, for most code vendors, most people who ship software, that's not really a big deal, right? Because most of the time, like you're shipping your own product. Um, a lot of stuff comes to the app store now. So it's not a problem. It's not a problem unless you're doing something really, really insane, like just letting arbitrary code run on your hardware at arbitrary times. Um, and yeah, uh, so it turns out that there is one class of application whose only job is running arbitrary code pulled from random places on the internet at arbitrary times. Um, and yeah, and, and it turns out that our entire competitive advantage, like we spent the last two years making that go really, really fast. And like surprise, now you get a timing attack for the, um, for the cause of your trouble. So that was, Bit of a kick in the teeth, um, and that cost us a couple of 
good months of work. But because it turns out, it turns out you've got to do if you are running a compiler all the time, you've got to do a lot of fairly subtle and often unpleasant stuff just to mitigate this entire class of attacks. Um, and Intel has come out and flatly said that, okay, listen, we're, we're protecting against these things. The process barrier is where we stop, right? Like if you want to, the process barrier is where we define, Intel defines the limits of application security um, from their perspective. And that's, that's okay. Um, it's not a great situation for us, but it is not so bad. Like it, ought to, it doesn't line up. Um, it doesn't mismatch horribly with the architectural decisions that we made leading up to this. Um, it would have been, if we had been where we were two years ago, right, um, where everything is running in one, like where everything, all the web pages we run are running in a single process, um, that would have been extremely bad. Uh, but fortunately for us, we're not there anymore. Um, we're now in a situation where we can actually manage the guts of our code well enough that we can mitigate timing attacks in a number of different ways by mitigating stuff along the process boundary, by uh, mitigating JS timing, a uh, bunch of other things. Still, um, it was unfortunate. It was a setback at the beginning of the year, and we probably could have spent that time. It would have been nice to spend that time and that engineering effort on something else. Um, but uh, my grandmother used to say that if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride, and um, that's kind of where we are. A lot of other things happened in the world, though, too, didn't they? Like, is anyone kind of feeling like 2018 is kind of a nervous year for a lot of reasons? Like, uh, yeah, well, a lot to do with information security, though. Um, maybe it doesn't look like it belongs to web browsers, but maybe it belongs to a lot of the things that web browsers seem to point at, and a lot of the information that gets sent uh, around on web browsers. Um, so maybe we don't have our hands directly in that, but maybe we have something to say about that. Maybe we have something important to say about that. Um, so that brings us to uh, a lot of what's next for us. It brings us to, a lot of this is decisions, okay, what does the world look like right now? We've had our heads down over the desktop product for the last two years. We made explicit decisions not to do a bunch of other stuff, including invest a ton of effort in mobile, including invest a ton of effort in services, including invest a ton of effort in uh, revenue diversification, right? Um, all of these things, it turns out, are going to matter, uh, and they're going to matter a lot. Um, and the, probably the more, the more notable ones uh, is mobile um, and our current mobile situation. Right now, the situation on mobile for us has been has been a little bit peripheral. Like quantum for the desktop has been the really big thing. But we've had a couple of irons in the fire around there. Um, that were not necessarily uh, Fennec, uh, Fennec being the code name for our mobile browser for a long time. We've had that working. Uh, we've had a browser on iOS for a little while. Um, the browser on iOS was, for a long time, sort of a, a thin wrapper around the usual browser WebKit thing that you get for iOS. Um, and now we need to stop and think more about that, because it turns out that mobile matters a lot. Um, almost everybody, like you're more likely to leave your house without your pants than you are to leave your house without your phone. Like, you cannot be an effective participant in modernity without a phone. Um, but that's where all of this information that people are newly aware that they are radiating comes from. That's where the ideas of, um, of well, I'll get to that in a minute. And one of the challenges of the mobile market in general is that it's really not an engineering problem, right? Uh, for us, for an engineer, like if we went and built the best mobile, if we just sat down and did quantum for mobile and said we're going to build the best mobile browser we can build, um, that's not going to move. Like it doesn't matter how much effort we put into that. It does not matter how brilliantly we succeed at that. Right? That's not going to move any market needle because every single phone out there comes with something. Right. The situation there is even worse than it is on desktops, right? It's not just that every phone out there comes with a browser on it. It's that if you're on iOS, you can't ship any other browser. You, it's very difficult to ship a meaningfully different browser on iOS. Um, maybe not impossible, but hard. Every phone out there in the Android ecosystem is just, the Android ecosystem is still the Wild West, 
right? But every part of that ecosystem, there's a recent antitrust suit, of course, where every part of that ecosystem has Chrome right there on the front page. Um, so how do we move that needle? Um, I, can we move that needle? That's a kind of a hard question, right? Because if it's not an engineering problem and we're an engineering company, what what do we do? Um, well, we have some options there. Um, maybe. And this is the interesting part because it turns out, oh, pardon me, I'm, I gesture a lot. Um, maybe the thing we need to do isn't ship a browser, right? Maybe we don't make web browsers. This is the kind of really, this is the kind of weird, dangerous talk that you see some companies get into um, when they no longer understand what their market really is or what their market is going. They say, oh no, we're not, you know, we're not making graphics cards, we're creating uh, experiences. And of course, every rational human being is looking at that going, no, you're selling graphics cards and you're not doing a great job of it, you're not getting away with that kind of talk. Um, you see this out in the world. Um, so this is a kind of a dangerous situation to be in, to say maybe we don't do the thing we've been obviously doing all of this time. Um, but, but, maybe we can double down on something else, right? Maybe we can double down on something that we have used for a long time, the way we've talked about the web browser for a long time, not as a display layer. Like we have never wanted the browser just to be an ersatz TV station. Right, where you click things and you get what you get. Right, the web. Our vision for the web has never been like a child's buffet. Right, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Right, that's the reason we have web extensions. That's the reason we let people modify content coming into the browser. The reason we have ad blockers. Um, it's the reason that we have this idea that we, as a user agent, right, we are the agent of you, the user. We are accountable to you. We are responsible to deliver what you want. And so maybe the thing for us to do here is not to just ship a really excellent display layer on the screen. Maybe the thing we should do here is double down on this idea that on mobile, it's even more important to be idiosyncratic. On mobile, it's even more important for us to invest in this idea that we work for you and to figure out what working for you actually means, right? Because it is idiosyncratic. It is really, really personal, right? So the question is not, can we make a really good web browser for Firefox or for mobile, right? Maybe the question is, where do people need us to be, right? Where do people need Mozilla to be, not just the browser, but the ideology? Like, where do people need us to be acting on their behalf, right? Where do people need a way for someone to give them the ability to act on their behalf, right? And if you start thinking like that, it turns out, yeah, there's kind of a lot of places where people need that, right? Maybe there's a lot of different places where people want to and should have agency over their data, their connections, over what hits them in the eyes, over what data they get admit to other places, right? We need to be in a lot of different places, it turns out, right? <laughs> Uh, and so we've got a couple of interesting products there. Some of these have been baking for a little while. Um, has anyone heard of Rocket, Firefox Rocket? So this is an interesting uh, project. I, if you look at it, it's a web browser. Uh, it's a combination of web browser. Um, it's a web browser that's focused in the Indonesian market, right? Because, uh, funny story, it turns out that what the web is and how people use the web is very, very culturally dependent. People use it very, very differently in very different places uh, to communicate in different ways. Uh, Rocket was intended to be a cut-down, ad-blocker-first uh, mobile browser, and that product, in an environment where, like, in an environment where, not just ad tracking, but where you pay for bandwidth, like, if you, your usage of the web, if you pay per kilobyte, is suddenly radically different, right? Suddenly, this idea of an ad-blocker by default in the browser, suddenly that's a really compelling offering, right? And there's also this screen, like it, after figuring out what it turns out, um, turns out the screenshots as well, taking screenshots of stuff and sending them to other people is a way that that market communicates with each other. This is how they share stuff, not by sending URLs, right? Who would have thought that? 
not me. I would never have suspected that. But people in the rocket target market use the hell out of that. Right? So much so that it's a decisive competitive advantage for us in that in that market. It just makes it people it makes it really easy for people to talk to each other in that culture the way they want to. Right? And that benefit, and the interesting thing about that is that that service supporting that comes back to benefit the rest of the, the Mozilla ecosystem in a lot of interesting ways, right? So we need a service that supports screenshots. Okay, great. Where else can we use that? Um, I bet the desktop. I bet desktop screenshots would be pretty good. Who else would use desktop screenshots? Developers use that. It turns out once we gave them the option of it. Yep, technical writers. Right? It turns out once we had learned that that was a valuable thing over there, um, it turns out that other people have managed to take that tool that we've built and use the hell out of it in other places. Um, likewise, uh, focus. Um, focus for, uh, focus with a very simple, cut down, privacy oriented web browser. Um, if you're using Android right now, uh, I believe it's available on iOS 2, I think so. Um, um, but yeah, it's fantastic. Um, It'll be, it'll still be in beta. I think if you're on the beta channel, it'll stay in the beta channel. Firefox is a very uh, privacy-oriented browser. Um, and uh, one of the things that we found out, we started out being, okay, privacy matters to us. Who can we use this for? A uh, couple of interesting things came out about that. The ability to, like, not save, a th not save your history. The ability to have stuff, a, a way to open stuff on your phone. And if you've ever thought to yourself, oh, it's a risky click. I don't know if I want that to be appearing in my history. Don't lie to me and say you haven't thought that, because every one of us has. Um, people have started using, uh, after we built that, people started using it not just for its own sake, people started using it uh, as their default browser coming out of their email. Like if people send you random crap, um, and I can't speak for the rest of you, but my inbox is occasionally a disaster, um, it's really useful to be able to say, okay, I want to look at this, but I want to look at it somewhere kind of hermetically sealed from the rest of my life, and I want to just back out of that without any, you know, without a lot of visibility on my other devices, if that's, and that's great. It works for that. But then people start using it for, um, the interesting thing is we saw people who started using it for kiosks, right? For sales kiosks. They want some kind of way to say, look, I want to, I want to put my credit card information into this stall, into this application that you're running. But I want some sort of confidence that you're not going to reopen that web browser once I've left and buy yourself, you know, your winter coat or whatever. Um, and so people have been leveraging our commitment, right? They're leveraging the Mozilla brand in this sense to give their customers a better experience or a more confident experience by saying, okay, you finished the transaction, clear history, great, we're done here. That doesn't work with a company you don't trust, right? <laughs> And we leveraged that, and just by virtue of being small, being lightweight, and so on, we were able to leverage that into a browser that we could build uh, in collaboration with Amazon and ship on uh, their Fire TV boxes. Uh, and so if you have an Amazon Fire Stick, uh, one of our, you know, our product is on there as well. And again, people are using it because something about, you know, using it not just because it's installed by default, which is nice in that case, um, but because something about that gives them that sense of confidence. We've also started looking into other places that we need to be, like the world. Uh, Firefox Monitor, we announced that last week. Has anyone heard of that? This is great. It's a collaboration with the, the Have I Been Owned, or Have I Been Pwned uh, gentleman, um, whose name escapes me at the moment. So if you're watching, guy, sorry. Um, but what it is, is it's a way of, you can go to uh, the Firefox Monitor and put your email in uh, to it, it doesn't actually record your email. It hashes it and sends it off like that. So we don't know what your email address is, but we can tell if that hash has appeared in other in a password breach, like in a major password breach in the last couple of years. Right. So we have a way for us to help identify if you have a password or an account that's been compromised at some service in the recent past. That's kind of interesting, but it's interesting when we start talking about this other thing we're working on called Lockbox. Lockbox is our upcoming password manager, right? The password manager in Firefox has needed a lot of love for a long time now. Um, but Lockbox, by making Lockbox a separate product, uh, we have some interesting opportunities there. Again, coming down to this idea of the user agent, right? Because there are protocols, there are upcoming web protocols now to allow a password reset without user intervention. 
right? Where if a user, if, if a, a device, like an OAuth device, has a, a token, has the right token, it can reset your password for you, that's right, um, and then update that in your personal password store, right? And then make a notify, min notify you later, right? Now, passwords are kind of weird and personal, so we're not sure how that's going to play out yet, but it's quite possible that we can use this combination of tools as your user agent to finally solve that problem where your inbox is the skeleton key to your entire life, right? We can finally solve that problem where if you have an account that's compromised with a password and you use the same password somewhere else because you're a human being and sometimes human beings do that, that we can actually address that for you without your ever having to think about it, right? You're going to put your password into a service once, right? And next time you go back to that service, it's going to show you a bar full of dots, and you're not even going to care. You're just going to say, yes, log me in. And that bar full of dots will have some ridiculous string behind it, right, that you don't need to worry about because it's strong enough that it's cryptographically secure. You're just better off because of it. And so that's one of the challenges that we have is the, not that we need to do something new on mobile, right? The challenge that we have on mobile really is picking where we want to be, right? Because all of this work still matters. There's so many opportunities to do this better, right? And that we can't be a part of all of them. The biggest challenge we have is deciding what to do, right? Because the work, there's meaningful work to be done here all over the place. Um, but maybe we don't need to be everywhere, right? Maybe, maybe there is a better way to do this, right? So, ask you a question. How many of you would be confident answering this? Some of you may have seen me speak before. This is a gag. My favorite part of talking in front of students is when I ask a room full of freshmen this, like, first year students, I ask, what is software? And you get a couple of kids who are like, oh, it's a trick. <laughs> right? This looks like an obvious question, but it's, it's like the smarter kids will realize it's a trap. Um, so what is software? If I were to ask you that, let me ask you a different question. If you feel like you would be confident in your answer, can we get a show of hands there? Sorry? That is a, that is a better, better numbers than average, I think. I've had an entire class full of people staring at me like, terrified at this. Right. So here's the thing that makes software completely unique. Right. Software is an idea that is also a machine. It is something you can take out of your head and turn into a device that does a thing, unlike anything else. Right. And the problem with that and the challenge of that is that it is a machine that we make out of our own values. Right. Out of our decisions, out of our politics, out of our priorities. You can see, and, and you see, you're all familiar with Conway's Law. This is one of my favorite things. Conway's Law is this observation that because the cost of human communication is so expensive compared to the cost of computer communication, that the structure of your, the internal architecture of your code, um, of your code base at your organization, is going to come to resemble your organization itself, like your org chart and how your teams communicate. And it's amazing because you can, uh, there are times when you can look at a code base and say, God, these two teams hate each other, right? You can look at a code base and say, okay, these people all worked in the same room, right? These people all sat next to each other because their API is just, their API is completely random nonsense because they didn't need anything structured because um, if they needed anything, they could just look over their shoulder to the guy who was responsible for that code base and ask him or her, hey, could you change it so I can do the thing? And they'll say, yeah. She'll say, sure, I can do the thing. And the thing gets done. And your code base is like this pile of spaghetti, but it seems to work. Right? That's a team where they're all in the same room. Um, in other cases, where you can see like it's where people describe their APIs as contracts. Like this is a contract, and you will get these API, and there's error handling. No, you don't get any error message. You get what you get, and you like it. Like you can tell that those two people just despise each other. Um, and the neat thing about, I'm going to, go off on a bit of a uh, bit of a tangent here, but one of the neat things is that that is very, very quantifiable. Um, that your communication structure starts to resemble your org chart. There's a magnificent research paper that came out on the heels of uh, Windows 
the Vista's release, right? And I just, seriously, did I just hear like half the room go, oh. <laughs> Windows Vista, oh. Fantastic. I hope the mic is really picking up the full effect of that because it was beautiful. Thank you all for that. Um, so Microsoft realizes that they have to learn something from this. And so they go to some academic researchers and they give them everything. All of the commit logs, all the chat logs, right? All the communications, the email. They give them access to the entire history of that project in codified form. Um, and what they learn is, fascinatingly, I'm going to ask you, what is the number one predictor that there will be a defect in a code base? The, lines of code. What's that? Lines of code. Lines of code? No. The number of programs. Number of programs? No, not quite. Anyone else? Lines, we have lines of code, which is not one. Yes. Fetched by the requirements, it's actually more than just that. The number one predictor that there will be a future defect in a piece of code is the org chart distance of the people working on it. Right? The distance, the, the, and not the physical distance. The, or, the distance in the org chart. Two people who are working in the same room but report to different VPs are wildly like, more likely to introduce a bug into their code than two people who are on opposite sides of the planet and report to the same manager, right? Because all of your communications in there about incentives, all of your communications about what your, you know, not your values, what are the values you should bake into this thing? What is important to you? It's gonna be very different from one VP to the next and that's gonna trickle all the way down until you've got two people who have fundamentally different ideas about why they're doing that at all, working on the same piece of code. Two people who are, and, and it, this outstrips everything else. It outstrips language barriers. It outstrips physical distance. It outstrips geography, right? Cultures, borders, everything else pales against that. It's fascinating. But that is not necessarily a curse, right? That's a tool, right? And so what can we do here to leverage a tool like that, leveraging that understanding? What can we do to take a big step past this idea that we've built into the code base all this time around experimentation. Right? We spent a lot of time building into Firefox for desktop this idea that we have to be able to gather telemetry in some safe, hygienic way. That we have to be able to do user experimentation and user-based segmentation in some safe, hermetic way. Right? Like we want to be able to run tests and experiments against part of our user base in a way that protects those users and respects those users privacy and all that stuff while still getting useful experimentation back. But what if we take a step back past that, right? If we're really talking about learning and building for and accommodating people's idiosyncrasies, maybe the thing we need to do is stop experimenting on our platform, right? Maybe the thing we need to do is to make the platform into an experiment. And that's what brings us to this, right? Android components are the big architectural change on the mobile side of things that we're working on right now, right? Not just taking not just building a good browser, right? But building parts you can snap together to make lots of different browsers, right? Making it really easy, not just for us to try new experiments and do new things, but making it easy for anybody who wants to pull this stuff in to build part, build maybe a browser, maybe something that looks like a browser, to build a user agent, right? Out of components that are built not just out of our code, but that out of our values as well. Right, and to build hopefully new experiences, new products and services out of them. We won't be able to get to all the places we need to be, right? But we can help other people get there with our tools, right? With our parts, most importantly, with our vision baked into it in some way, right? Phoenix is the next generation for us of the browser, right? This is our proving ground platform for all of these components. Is it going to be the best web browser out there, a mobile web browser out there? Maybe. Is that going to matter? Not on its own, right? What's going to matter is that we have a demonstrated way to say you can take this stuff, right, and you can build something great out of it. And you can take it from us and go build something else, somewhere else, right? 
one of the things that we're working on here is premium services and partnerships with other organizations, right? Trying to figure out, uh, now that the ad industry, which is uh, in a bad way for a lot of different reasons, um, uh, most of the ad industry right now, despite the fact that it's what keeps a lot of the lights on for tech companies, uh, seems to be made mostly of like fake news, rage clicks, and um, fraud. Uh, something like 40% of the online ad market right now is just straight up theft. Um, theft. It's some, something something on the order. Like the last time I looked, those numbers were somewhere between 35 and 40% fraudulent. Um, that seems like a lot. I don't know about you. Um, I don't want 30 or 40% of my day of anything I'm involved with to be like fraud. Um, and so that doesn't feel sustainable. Um, but I think that the idea of what Mozilla brings to the table here is, right? I'm still, I'm still naive enough, I guess, um, and optimistic enough to believe that this matters. Right. This is a conversation that we have at every level of our organization, right? at the design, at the implementation, at the engineering, the management director, and senior leadership level. When we're building this stuff, our question is, are we holding up our end of the deal? Right? Are we holding up, the, are we sticking to the promise of Mozilla? Right? The idea that we are an agent of, that is accountable to the user that we are treating your data, your privacy, with this degree of respect, right? That, that we offer you more control over your user data, right? Are you safer with us, right, than you are with any of our competitors, right? That's the, that's, that's the bar we've set for ourselves, right? And by breaking this stuff up into parts, parts you can reuse, what we hope is to give the rest, a lot of other people, a chance to go to their space, their their market niche, their culture, their environment, and to do that as well, right? To build something that's relevant to them out of components that do, that respect the values that we believe in and that advance the goals we believe in as a mission. Um, I'm naive enough to think this stuff still matters, I guess. Um, I'm optimistic enough to think that after the year we've had, um, that having people have agency over their data, over their communication over what data they emit, what they take in, about what their online lives look like. I still think that matters a lot. And I'm really, frankly, optimistic about the work that we're doing right now around the mobile ecosystem, because it turns out that that's probably going to be the computer most people get, right, um, is going to be your phone, uh, to give people in that environment a chance to have that kind of agency over the future, um, and to have that agency be one that treats, I don't know, be one that treats the future with that kind of care and respect. Thank you.